So I'm going to kick off anyway. Sorry, I can't be with you folks today. Um, I wish I could be there, but uh, just damaged my back, so I'm doing this from my home in Scotland. Uh, and anyway, <clears throat> what I'm going to talk about is affordances of learning analytics for students and instructors. And it's a subject that's close to my heart. I've been working in this area uh, pretty much exclusively now for about three years. Um, and find the whole thing incredibly interesting because it's such a, a good combination of the pedagogical side, the technological side, and issues such as uh, strategic change in institutions, the legal side, and the ethics. All these things come together uh, and provide a very interesting area for investigation. Now, I thought I'd just start off by listing the applications that I've identified for learning analytics, that the primary ones uh, are, uh, I identified four major application areas from the literature. And the first one, which is by far the most high profile, is early alert and student success systems. And uh, these aim to use data about students maybe their demographics, so uh, things that you know about them before they start, such as their family background, their income level, their um, ethnicity even, um, their prior educational qualifications, uh, and, and these kind of demographic factors, and they combine that with um, students' engagement in learning activities or in other activities. This is a, an example here in Nottingham Trent University in the UK, uh, where you can see the blue line represents a particular student and the red line represents the class average for engagement uh, in the virtual learning environment, the accesses to library and accesses to buildings using um, cards to get into buildings. And you can see that uh, in, in November 2014, that student has uh, started to diverge quite a bit in the cumulative engagement rating uh, from the main class. And at that point, represented by that vertical line, the tutor took an intervention, arranged to meet Dakota, and uh, then set him or her off uh, on what looks like a successful strategy. Uh, who knows what the, the individual circumstances of this person are. But by uh, the end of this period, she has nearly caught up with the class average on the cumulative engagement. And at the same time, you can see on the right hand side, her current rating for engagement is high. And the trend is upwards. So th this looks like um, hopefully a success story for that intervention. Or maybe she just changed any, something's changed in her circumstances. And um, this is being used across that university and similar systems in many other institutions now to try and identify students at risk of failure or dropout very early, much earlier than you could do previously, and uh, do something about it to try and find out what the problem is and get them back on track. Another... Um, way you can visualize the data is through a dashboard. Here's a, a typical one where you can instantly see if the engagement of your students is low, satisfactory, good, high. And then you can prioritize as a instructor what you do to, uh, or who, who you address first, who you put your efforts into. I mean, one of the issues here is that you can spend an awful lot of time uh, with the poor performing students or the ones that have limited engagement, trying to contact them, uh, putting all your efforts into them, and then ignore students who could benefit from your efforts and, and perhaps turn from a, a good student into a, uh, an excellent student. So there's that, that whole area of triage uh, as well that these, these systems can potentially start to help with. All this, of course, is, is based on the assumption that high engagement is correlated with uh, student success in exams and uh, completion of their courses, which tends to be the case. But you've probably encountered students who don't turn up to lectures, um, but are perhaps beavering away 
quietly on their own and, and or don't do much before the exam, but they're they're bright enough that they can they can actually get through at the end. But that's that's the exception these days, and most students uh, really do need to put the effort in in order to succeed. Here's another one: Blackboard predicts student risk reports. This is aimed at the instructor. You can see instantly there are 40 students in the class, and there are eight of them that are high risk. Uh, and looking down the list, you can see those first two have 0% chance of passing the module, uh, probably because they just haven't fulfilled some assessment requirement. So you could arrange a chat with them, perhaps, and see if they want to transfer to another course or just find out what the, what the issue is. The most uh, famous example of learning analytics, really, uh, that, that inspired a lot of people to get involved in it, was is the Signals Project project at Purdue University. And you can see uh, this is an app for a student, Mary Major, so she can instantly see how she's doing in her different courses. Uh, you can see in the second time period there, she struggled with Spanish, perhaps. She had an orange light, traffic light, uh, but then perhaps because she saw that, she took extra action and got back into um, green light for the, the third period, so she seems to be on track. There is a danger with these systems, of course, that students start to believe them as fact, uh, and actually they're just an indication. Uh, predictions are not the same as, as facts and reality. <clears throat> now, signals at Purdue, uh, the advantages of this are, include that problems can be identified as early as the second week of the semester, much earlier than before and instructors then take a range of interventions if they identify a student who's looking uh, like they might be struggling such as posting a signal on their home page emailing or texting them or arranging a meeting and they've found that courses that deploy this system consistently see better grades by students whether it's because uh, the information is genuinely useful or because it just is giving more feedback to students. Uh, the reasons for that aren't totally clear, but the fact that that system is deployed in those courses does seem to enhance performance. And also students using courses deploying signals seek help earlier and much more frequently than those who don't, uh, or sorry, than the courses that don't deploy it. So it's, that's the the area for learning analytics that's created the most interest worldwide. But there are all sorts of other uses. And the second major one uh, that is talked about in the literature is course recommendation systems. Now, <clears throat> in the United States uh, in particular, there are many different options that students have to choose from. And these systems look at students' aptitudes based on previous performance. they um, career aspirations and various other factors and then plot out uh, the courses for them and recommend the ones that they should take next. Uh, these are very popular systems. The students love them because it, it gives you a prediction as to how well you are likely to do in a future module. Um, so in this case they're recommended to do general anthropology uh, and it's given a rating 7 out of 10 which equates to how well they think the system thinks that maps onto your career aspirations and how well you're actually likely to do it in it. Um, so there are issues with this in that um, it might tend to bring the easiest courses to the top of the selection uh, list all the time and start to dumb down the kind of academic rigor of the curriculum, uh, meaning that all students just start doing the easy courses and, and they don't do a more comprehensive degree that might perhaps contain more mathematical content in some subjects. But uh, it seems to be a hugely popular system and it does, people that use this system uh, do do better overall. So there's quite a correlation between use of the system and success overall. So it's very difficult to argue uh, that this system could be taken away now in those universities that deploy it. The third major application for learning analytics uh, is adaptive learning systems. And I think these are going to become more and more frequent, uh, more sophisticated uh, as a way of teaching students content. We'll, we'll see them 
in schools increasingly, and then uh, they'll move into universities um, increasingly as well. And you can use these to teach any subject, not just kind of mathematical subjects with the right answer, but history, um, arts and, and humanities subjects are being taught this way, again, primarily in uh, American universities, but beginning to penetrate elsewhere. Uh, and the idea again here is that the, the education is more personalized. It learns from the student's performance. It adapts what it's delivering to that student uh, based on how they're doing. You can build in concepts such as mastery, so you can't move on to the next course until, sorry, the next bit of content until you've mastered uh, the topic that you need to do first. And also, uh, that in itself becomes a very useful source of learning analytics data. So if you're performing badly in these adaptive learning systems, that could be mapped onto your prior educational qualifications, your engagement in lectures as well, and that might itself produce a risk factor which could uh, be taken on board by a tutor supporting you to try and uh, improve things for you. Here's a a system called Cogbooks, and this is an instructor dashboard. So the student's learning medicine, and they're all in a big lab, uh, and the instructor's sitting at the front there and can look at how students are performing and then go and uh, speak to them uh, if they seem like they're struggling. So just blowing that up a bit, you can see this student uh, took that pathway through the different bits of the course. They've understood six concepts, they've skipped a couple of tests, and there's one concept they didn't understand. So it may be that the instructor walks over to the desk and says, um, look, see you didn't understand this concept, do you want me to explain it to you? Again, this seems to be a popular form of learning increasingly, um, and maybe almost inevitably will be more effective than lectures because of the active nature of the engagement of the student. But, I mean, my feeling is that this is just probably not going to be the exclusive way that students learn in the future, but it's just a useful additional uh, tool in the armory of the academic. And uh, the, the final area which I've seen um, talked about and written about increasingly, and I think is really possibly the most interesting of all, is the ability to enhance our curricula based on data about how students are working through it and uh, whether they're succeeding in understanding the concepts you're trying to teach them, for example. So I'm not going to explain this diagram right now, um, but it's possible to, to look at the relationship between learning design, student behavior, their performance, um, and how feedback can be used to enhance the curriculum. Just to give you an example, that these are the kind of things that you might want to ask of your curriculum. Is the student behavior that you have planned for this module as expected? Are students actually doing what you, you had hoped they'd done when you designed it? Are the groups working? So if you've got forums or group working of some sort, is that actually functioning properly? And the data should be able to give you some insight into answering these questions. Are assignments being submitted on time? Very easy to ascertain that. Is student performance on assessments satisfactory? Of course, that's really critical. Um, and it may be that you've designed some aspect of your course in a way that wasn't helping them to uh, achieve those assessments. And to what extent did teacher behavior affect student behavior? So this is a big uh, controversial issue for learning analytics. Um, I personally feel that you cannot ignore the role of the teacher in the overall effectiveness of the learning. Uh, if you're going to look at every aspect of student performance and engagement, but you ignore the fact that the teacher has a big role in that, then you're not doing the students uh, any favours. But of course, there's a balance between trying to get the best result for the students across the institution and the best teaching and then not being too intrusive uh, in the uh, actions of the 
over the actions of the, the teachers. So there'll be uh, increasing attention given to that, I think, uh, but it needs to be done in a sensitive way so that there isn't a backlash from lecturers who don't like to be monitored. Uh, here's an example of a particular issue you might identify from the data. A key piece of learning content that you think is really important for your students is not being accessed by most of them. So that then might lead you to ask some questions. Was the content too difficult? So that's why they didn't bother with it. Was it sequenced at the wrong time? Perhaps um, there were assessments uh, at that time. Perhaps other other courses other courses had a lot of assessments, so they just didn't have time to go into that content. Or did you not properly communicate the importance of it to the students? And then you might take an intervention, uh, and that might be ask the students why they're not accessing it. You could make it easier to find, and you could communicate its importance better. Another example is that a particular minority group is not performing well in an aspect of the curriculum. So you identify this from the data and then wonder why. Is it due to linguistic or cultural issues, due to lack of pre prerequisite knowledge or skills, or perhaps financial issues of that particular group of students? And the intervention then might be to target additional support at the minority group. And this is based on a real example of a university in England where uh, a particular ethnic group was struggling with aspects of the law curriculum that they were studying. Um, and this was shown up from the data. So a special series of classes was held for that group and uh, the performance of those students then was boosted to the uh, similar to the average of the, the whole cohort. So that's um, the applications. Now, um, there are also techniques of learning analytics. I'm only going to talk about a few of them very briefly. Uh, one of them is social network analysis. So this is a technique that's being used in all sorts of other areas, in business, in anthropology, um, in other sciences. And you can see those circles there represent individual students. Uh, that one in the middle there, <clears throat> with all the arrows pointing to it, is a particularly well-connected student uh, known as a node. Uh, and you can see the strength of their connections to others as well, represented by those lines with a number on it. So some of them, they have better connections with students than others based on that number. Uh, one example was this system, Blackboard X-Ray Learning Analytics, which shows a simple mapping between all the students in the class. This is based on activity in, in forums, by the way, online forums. And um, you can see Jonathan there has no friends, poor guy. So the lecturer could identify that and perhaps say to one of the more active students, can you bring Jonathan into the conversation or, or bring them in, uh, him or herself. Uh, and uh, a quick way of seeing whether there might be an issue with that person. Another technique that's being used is called discourse analytics, and this is uh, an automated evaluation of student contributions to forums or uh, short assessment questions, for example, to identify whether there might be problems with that student's understanding of a, a topic. Here's an example of one student's contribution. I'm not going to read it out, but just look at the kind of language that they're using there. And here's a, a different response to another question, uh, but you can see the contrast between that and the first one. This student is using more sophisticated language, uh, is asking questions um, that show that they're interested in um, the topic. And it's just generally the sign of um, a student that has a more sophisticated approach and understanding to the topic than the first one. And of course, um, artificial intelligence systems are getting more and more sophisticated at understanding those kind of responses and being able to analyse them. And I think we'll see increasing use of this in the future where uh, not only can you use AI systems to mark assignments written like this automatically, 
but also um, they can identify students that might be struggling with a particular topic and again enable you to target interventions with those students directly. Now I'm just checking the time here uh, so I'm going to make sure I don't go on too long. I think I've got till yeah I've got till another maybe another five minutes or so. Um, here or ten minutes. Here's uh, another um, technique: sentiment and emotion analytics. So um, again, you can look at what students are writing or even saying, uh, and identify these kind of emotions from uh, what they're what they're communicating. Uh, and this can be used again to identify students that might be at risk. So a student that is expressing endless frustration. Uh, sarcasm, unhappiness, uh, may be in trouble. Um, on the other hand, someone that is entirely happy all the time may not be living in the real world and it may be good for them to be having a bit of um, dis disappointment occasionally to, to make them actually uh, put a bit more effort in, effort in. So we're only at the beginning of our understanding of that kind of uh, technique, but there, there are uh, also the use of emoticons. So there's a system in uh, University of New England in New South Wales where students every day are encouraged to um, click an emoticon which represents their level of happiness that day. And those who are deemed, who click the very unhappy emoticon are contacted that day by someone from Student Support Services. But generally, it's used to assess the level of aggregate happiness among the student body and to try and understand what's going on with them. So just a quick summary of uh, the different applications and the different techniques. And it took me a long time to work out, really, that this is uh, one way to divide these two areas uh, because people just talk about predictive analytics, social network analytics, adaptive learning, um, as if they're just equivalent um, phenomena, but uh, I think, think this is a, a good way to understand the whole area of learning analytics. So I'm just going to talk about student facing analytics uh, because I think this is a big growth area uh, and people have talked about the quantified self movement, so the use of uh, fitness trackers for example and then trying to apply that to the educational sphere. Working with JISC in the UK, we did a lot of work to define what students wanted out of uh, a student-facing learning analytics app. And these were the principles that the app is attempting to embody. So it would be comparative. It would allow you to compare your performance with other students. Social, so it allows you to um, socialise or um, do social networking with other students. <clears throat> Incorporate some kind of gamification. Your data would be private by default and it would be usable standalone without connecting to your university system if you wanted to and an uncluttered interface. And here's the result. This is a system that's been rolled out to students in UK universities now. Uh, there's an activity feed so you can see what your friends uh, have been doing. The idea is that it motivates you uh, and gives you feedback on what others are doing so that you know, hopefully you do more yourself. Points are awarded for what you do, and you can then um, compare your activity points with other friends um, with the course average. You can set targets for yourself uh, and then see if you've met those targets and, and log activities towards meeting those targets. Uh, and just generally use this, this app to help motivate you and give you better feedback on how you're doing. And this is a feature that was recently built in, which uh, was asked for by the universities um, because one of the main bits of data that's of relevance is whether a student has attended lectures because, of course, there's a correlation between student attendance at lectures and tutorials and their final grade. So um, at the start of the lecture, the lecturer says, right, um, can you enter this code into your app, students enter it in and then it's logged that they've attended that lecture. So it's just another useful bit of data. 
Uh, finally, I'm just going to just ask or mention a few things about what I think may be coming next based on interviews I did with 20 different um, experts in the area for my book. Uh, first of all, new data sources. Now, lots of people are talking about the fact we don't have enough data to really understand the learning of the students properly. We do have an awful lot and we, we can get better at capturing it and understanding it. But people are talking about using fitness trackers, uh, multimodal uh, analysis techniques so that you can look at people do eye tracking and all sorts of uh, quite intrusive techniques. Um, and I think we're quite a long way from having that mainstreamed, if ever, because of the ethical issues. This is one example of why we need to be careful. This exam, this uh, Oral Roberts University uh, gives fitness trackers to all the students and um, has made them wear them. And of course, there's a backlash with that because of the intrusiveness. It's trying to monitor their sleep and their fitness and see if that correlates with uh, educational performance. So I think we will see increasing um, data sources used, but uh, we'll have to be very careful that we don't do that in an intrusive way and that we obtain the, the full permission and approval of the students at every stage and that their ability to opt out for those things uh, by the students. Another sentiment that was expressed by a lot of people I interviewed was that analytics should become kind of normal practice. So it becomes as common as a chalkboard is to a classroom today. So just having that data about your students or the students having data about themselves becomes a really um, natural thing. And we all have that and we're all used to it. Uh, and it's just part of the, the whole system of, of education. <clears throat> Personalization is obviously uh, increasingly talked about and increasingly possible. So Bart Rientes at the Open University uh, thinks this is where we're really heading and what the ultimate aim of learning analytics should be. It can identify the shape of every module and know exactly which kind of path students have to take and then provide a completely personalized path for our students. My feeling is that's only part of the story. It's not just about personalization. Uh, it's about us identifying how we can improve the curriculum uh, all the time as well. But uh, that's certainly an interesting possibility. And finally, I'll just leave you with this thought from Dragan Gasevich, one of the leading thinkers in this area. We may have to redesign our courses in order to motivate students to communicate more. So we don't have enough data to do this um, really comprehensively. And in order to get more data, we need to build in more activity from the students, uh, which is captured electronically, and more communication with each other, again, captured electronically if possible. And then that provides uh, a really good data source for um, enhancing our, our understanding of what's happening. So that's enough from me. I'm going to... Um, quit this presentation now and see if I can broadcast my picture and then I think we've got a few minutes for questions. <clears throat>